This episode of Vision, Hustle, Grit, and Gratitude is brought to you by our Michigan-based firm, Mass Mutual Great Lakes. Visit greatlakes.massmutual.com backslash careers today to start a conversation around opportunities to join our firm. I think you have to have a lot of faith when you're a small business owner or you're going to be an entrepreneur or a founder or a co-founder. I mean, I think everyone's really a co-founder because who's really a founder that does anything by themselves? Really no one. But everyone's, if you're a co-founder and you're doing it with a group, um, I think the number one thing is having the courage to jump in. All right, everyone, welcome on in to another episode of the Vision, Hustle, Grit, and Gratitude podcast. Uh, today, I'm joined by Johnny Immerman. And Johnny, I can't tell you uh, how excited I am and how much I'm looking forward to this conversation. Before we dive in to your story, or a little bit more specifically, I, I got to tell you, as I as I did some research behind who you were and and what you've done and what you've gone through and what you've accomplished since, the word legacy just kept coming to mind. And 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 I think that the work you've done and the impact that you're making, I I, I just I, I keep reflecting on that word legacy. I wanted to start there and ask you, you know, what does that word legacy mean to you or represent to you in, in in what you're trying to accomplish? Well, C. Miles, great to see you. Honored to be here. Great to chat with you. And um, thank you for your kind words. You know, one, one thing I'll start with, legacy to me and anything people do is based on your team around you. It takes a team. It takes a group. Everything we've been able to accomplish is because we've surrounded ourselves with people who care people who are passionate, people who care about others outside of themselves and want to make a positive difference in the community. Um, but legacy to me is sort of a continuum. It's sort of a long-term over and again, um, how do we do good and how do we continuously do good going forward? So um, I, I will say we've been in social impact 20 years. It does feel like a long time, um, kind of left the corporate world behind um, about 2000, I don't know what it was, three or four-ish or so. And um, it's been a great run in the social impact space. But again, everything we've done is, is done by a team Immerman Angels itself has just been an amazing group of survivors who care and want to help and want to give back to others. But nothing works unless survivors did care, unless they were willing to give their time and energy. But together, it's amazing how groups can move mountains. It takes a team. And, and so let's let's uh, catch up our audience here on, uh, talk to us about that transition that you made from, from being in the corporate space to ultimately ending up in the social impact space. Uh, uh, fill us in a little bit on your background and story. Absolutely. Thank you, C. Miles. You know, I am a very lucky, blessed guy uh, from Detroit area, just like you, and uh, was a couple years out of Ann Arbor, uh, 26, got diagnosed with pretty advanced cancer, testicular cancer. Didn't even know what testicular cancer was at the time, you know, it was totally, totally oblivious. And I think we need to educate everybody that it's the number one most common young men's cancer in this country. And most people don't know that. Most young guys don't know that. For 20 years of a man's life, 15 years old, 35 years old, for 20 years, the youth, it's the number one most likely cancer to get for men. So guys need to check. They need to feel for a bump. You need to go to the doctor once a year. You need to find these things early. You generally save people's lives if you find it early. And if you don't go to the doctor, like me, I didn't go for five years. Horrible to say, but it's the truth. I just didn't think I had to because I went to the gym and I hooped with my friends and I thought I ate kind of healthy. So for my junior year in college, from 21 years old, and I didn't sleep that much. And I thought I was, you know, bounced and I felt great and I could get by a little sleep. And I you just didn't think about it. And all of a sudden I had pain in my left testicle that doubled me over. I literally turned on like a light switch. It was a Saturday night. 
I'm in a bar. I was actually in Ann Arbor with some friends in grad school, a couple of my buddies from high school and law school there, and some other their friends, and three guys, three girls, we're shooting pool, Saturday night, typical night, nothing out of the ordinary, having some beers, and all of a sudden, the worst pain of my life flipped on like a light switch, and guys like you, C. Miles, and the men out there can relate, and women, take my word for it, it's a very sensitive organ, it felt like out of the blue, in a snap, Someone took a knife and stabbed me violently in the left testicle, excruciating pain. I dropped the pool stick. I doubled over. I couldn't even stand up. Of course, my friend said, we'll carry you over our shoulder, take you to the hospital. And like a bullheaded 26-year-old male, I said, guys, I'll figure this out. Don't worry. And I, which is very stupid, but true. And I waddle out of the bar and I get to my car. Now I can't even touch the pedals of the car because my legs are locked in this sort of fetal baby type position. And I'm starting to cry in pain. I'm like, what do I do? And I finally start to push on my quads, like getting my legs to touch a pedal. It took me minutes. And I finally drove the car, got to the hospital. And then I have a doctor sitting down, crossing his legs, running his hands through his hair saying, listen, kid, I'm so sorry. You have advanced cancer, it's testicular cancer, and we need to cut this out immediately and we need to do chemo right away. And my whole world kind of spun in a second. Never thought about it before. I didn't even know really what testicular cancer is or was. And um, they cut the left testicle out. Then I had to bank sperm. Most of us are going to be sterile. You know, we can't have our own children with the one testicle we do have. So all this happens so quickly. You have to make quick decisions, process quickly. Um, and then immediately at a port that was inserted into my left arm, that's where um, the, the chemo would go in. It runs a catheter line to your heart. And then um, we started chemo. And chemo was basically eight hours a day. Monday through Friday was, was the first week of every cycle, um, eight hours at the hospital. I did it at Carmanos right downtown in Detroit and U of M Cancer Center. I was treated at both um, and went through all these treatments. But it's so important that we teach people to get checked, to be educated about their bodies. If something's different, go in because time matters. That's really how we save more lives. And that's really why we created Emmerman Angels at the end Immerman Angels is a 501c3 nonprofit, C Miles. And we created it because a group of survivors and I met at the hospital in Detroit at the very end of two years of treatment. We buddied up, we all wanted to give back, and we all agreed wait, the missing piece, the broken part of this cancer. None of us knew survivors who were young who beat the same thing right from the beginning. And how do we be there for those now who are just starting their fight? How do we be mentors? How do we prove to them they can do it, teach them what they need to know, keep them on the right path? And we created Intermittent Angels as a one-on-one -on -one peer mentor support. So if someone's diagnosed in Detroit with stage three colon cancer, we may know someone in New York who beats stage three colon cancer, who's your age, who says, been there, done that, beat it. I'll walk you through this whole journey and I get it. And one-on-one, -on -one, that's your mentor. Um, today, we have 12,000 mentors across about 100 countries, every U.S. state. We're the largest group in the world. We're very blessed to be mentors, to give back. So no one fights alone. We have 10 full-time staff, all based in Chicago. Um, they have hearts that you would not believe how big they are. They work seven days a week, pretty much. They love their jobs. Um, and that's what our mission is, that no one goes through this without knowing someone who's been there went through it, is doing well, and can walk the walk and speak the talk to say, look, I did it, so can you, here's how to get there. And Everman Angels is free, it will always be free. We're always looking to help more people who need help or survivors who wanna be those mentors. We have 12,000, we could have 12 million. You know, anyone out there who has a story, who wants to give back, join the team. Again, the team, the team, the team. It's always worked because we have a great team who really cares about other people. And, and so tell me a little bit, Johnny, about, you know, you, you go through your own personal cancer experience and, and, and a lot of our community tends to be in the business community. Talk to me a little, little bit of just about, again, you talked about this transition from being in the corporate world to now going into the social impact space. From, from your own personal mindset, the way that you're approaching business, the way that you're approaching the work that you were doing at the time, talk to me about that transition that your own cancer experience took you through? 
Absolutely. You know, I worked for a guy named Matt Lester and I worked in commercial property management and real estate. And he owned at the time, early 2000s, um, a bunch of property, maybe 40 properties, like medical office buildings, multifamily apartments. And I helped him manage it. And it was okay. I mean, I, it was stimulating in some ways. But once I got sick and went through two years of that, I basically woke up. Um, it's very typical, which I've learned later, that survivors afterwards, we make many sometimes big rash decisions. Sometimes they work out well, sometimes they don't, but I think it's good to be aware that this is actually a phenomenon, like this does happen, but I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. But I quit my job, I left the corporate world behind, I remember thinking at 28, when I finally was clean, my last surgery, I had four tumors behind my kidney, sort of near my spine. So I had an 11 inch vertical incision from my sternum, literally from about right here, all the way down to the pubic bone, 11 inches up and down, sliced me open, took out all my internal organs, the stomach, the liver, the kidneys, the intestines. I was like hollow, cut out the four tumors in the back, um, put all the organs back in, stitched it up, and um, stapled me up. And when I woke up, um, you know, it took obviously months to like get back on my feet and moving around and getting back in the gym. But after that, that was like the big kicker where I was like, I think I'm done with, with corporate world. I just want to do things and make the world better. If I lived to 30 years old, I will call that the greatest victory ever in the world. That's all I kind of want. It was like two more years. I remember thinking that uh, now I'm 45. It's amazing how far life continues to go. At the time, that's what I felt. And I said, I'm just gonna, you know, help people. I, I got involved with these survivors, we buddied up, we became super close. You know, we all had so much in common as young adult survivors. And we knew that going back to the hospital on Saturday um, to volunteer or Tuesday after work to go talk to patients, the doctors would send us into rooms and say, hey guys, you know, patient room six, there's a young girl in there named Angela. She's 22, she's in her twenties, just like you. She has leukemia, she's as bald as you guys. You know, we were all right out of chemo. So we're all bald too. And you know, she's alone and she's scared and she doesn't have family around and she's depressed. Like go give her a pump up. That's kind of how we started was going door to door and giving these pump ups. And we just saw it work and we got obsessed with these connections. And that's why we created Immerman Angels to say, it's great to go door to door randomly and help people, but why don't we actually be more strategic? That's when we started to get uh, more effective, I think, when we sort of use our like, you know, strategic minds to make this as effective as it could be. And when we saw it work, see Miles to your question, I got obsessed with seeing it work and we're like, we just got to help the next person, the next person. And it just seemed more important than what I was doing. And, and I loved it and moved to Chicago. It was another one of the big rash decisions. Woke up one day and was like, I want to move to Chicago because I can, it's not going to kill me if it doesn't work out. You know, I can move somewhere else. I think our tolerance for making bad decisions goes way up when you're like, hey, I could have died last year. So this can't be that, that risky of a decision. Moved to Chicago, quit my job. Again, many rash decisions in a row within a short period of time after cancer. And it turned out to be both those things were great decisions. I was very blessed that I did. I was also dating a girl for a long time. We broke up. So it was like, that relation, she was a wonderful girl. She was very supportive of me. And we're still very friendly today, which is great. She's a good person. And she was there for me when I was sick. But the relationship ended, moved to Chicago, quit the corporate world, started up a 501c3 nonprofit, co-founding with a group. And, um, you know, it just, I never looked back. Once we saw it working, we never looked back. In the city of Chicago, I'll always be grateful. Those first two years, we were on every TV station, every radio station. Um, they just loved it. They embraced it. It's a pretty dense downtown, Northwestern, Rush, University of Chicago, all the hospitals got on board. They started sending us patients and we just started booming and helping thousands of people, which we do now uh, every year. And you just kind of never looked back. You know, I was like, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is working. We'll figure out how to make a career out of this. And today we have 10 full families that are full time that we support. But more importantly, we all get to do and we get to help the people that we that need help. 
So talk to me a little bit, you know, you, you make the comment there at the end about, you know, figuring out how to make a career out of this. When, when you're making some of these, as you say, some of these rash decisions and, and they're big life changes for you. I mean, I, I think we can all relate to that to some extent, whether we've made that decision, you know, uh, um, we, we work with a lot of times our audience of whether it's college students who are looking to jump into their first career, maybe it's into entrepreneurship. You talk about athletes that are leaving the athletic world jumping into the business world, making those big jumps, those big changes. I mean, what's going through your mind and what do you look back on and what led you to success, do you think, as, as you're making these, these big changes? And as you can look back now and say, hey, th they ended up working out, but you didn't know that at the time, right? Absolutely. No, it's scary for everyone. Any entrepreneur that starts something or co-founds and says that they're not scared, um, I, I personally wouldn't believe them. I was like terrified at the same time I was exhilarated because like I just, my heart was all in it. But of course you're like scared and you're like, what if it doesn't work out? And we put all this time and energy, we file a 501c3, we put a board together and it crashes and burns. And I think I would start to reflect back on cancer. I'm like, hey, well, if it fails, that's still not as bad as dying. And that could have happened last year, the year before, you know, two months or so had I not gotten my cancer, two months longer, other than that pain, my cancer would have spread. It already spread into my um, pelvis, abdomen, behind my kidneys, almost to my lungs. And um, two more months would have been in my lungs, neck and brain. And that's when most people, uh, we lose them. So that, that, that was pretty clear in my head. And I was like, you know, the worst thing, I always got myself back to thinking, hey, failure at this is not the worst thing, right? And it's not going to kill you. You'll figure it out. But I will tell you what really helped and how we did it to your question, C Miles, is again, the team. We built great relationships. We met people in the cancer world in Chicago. Every time we won an ABC, CVS, um, CNN, whatever it was, someone's, someone's international press, we were in the, uh, we were really blessed. We were in the, the Wall Street Journal. Every time we got stuff like that, the phones would start ringing, emails would start rolling in, survivors out there said, I want to be a part of this. Like, I have a story, like I know it can help the next person. Like I've been wanting to give back, but like there's no system to do it and it just didn't exist. And so we became sort of the pioneers of this one-on-one -on -one movement and survivors started getting so excited. We built great relationships. And every time I met another survivor and they wanted to be a mentor, the purity, the generosity, the passion. I just like, we have an awesome team. This team is just gonna figure it out. And every time we match someone, we also said to ourselves, this is working. If we just keep doing this and we keep matching people and we keep helping them, something good is just gonna happen. Let's just not stop, keep pushing forward, pulling people on this team as much as we can. Um, Interman Angels now is a thousand local volunteers just in Chicago. Some are survivors, some are not, but just people who truly wanna help. Um, and we have four boards, 160 board members across four boards, 12,000 mentors now across the planet um, in about 100 countries. And it's the epitome of building relationships and having teams. So whether you're in business, whether you're in social impact, whether you're in a hybrid, everything boils down to the people around you and your team. And I'm a huge believer that one person doesn't really do much at all. In fact, nothing but when you have a group of people with all different school set, skill sets, an inclusive group, that's how you're gonna make systemic change. And um, I've been grateful to be on this team with everybody um, and really changing the way that people go through cancer. I can, uh, you're, I, I can tell that you're a, a Michigan guy, right? I'm, I'm thinking of that quote, the team, the team, the team. I believe that was a, 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 a Bo Schembechler quote. Uh, but that so is spot on. Yeah. So, so continuing on this idea of, but you've mentioned many times, you know, from the first question, when we talk about legacy, you've, you've referred back to your team. And so if, if I have you really put on the CEO hat now, talk to me a little bit about, I think, you know, many business owners, and even as a manager myself, I recognize how finding the right teammates and building a team that you, you enjoy, the team members enjoy themselves and that you can go and you can conquer missions together, right? Building and structuring a team like that, it's not easy. It's not an easy thing to do. And I think that there's many people that, that struggle with that. I mean, tell me a little bit about your personal 
perspective and experience on how are you going about building this team and this team culture that you're talking about that's been able to accomplish so many special things? Thank you, Sue Miles. I, I love this question. It's a really good question because um, it helps a lot, which fortunately I do, and I did before cancer, and I probably do now even more after cancer. If you love people and you're curious about learning about people and what makes them tick, um, where has their li- where their lives been, how have they gotten to their path, where are they trying to go? Maybe you can know somebody that can be in their path to help them accomplish something. But if you truly love people and you're fascinated by humans, I mean, I can't think of anything in the world that I like more than human beings and animals. I'm a big animal lover too, but living things, right? Not stuff that's like stuff you buy, not cars, not houses, not boats, but people, right? That's why we're here on this planet is being, you know, connecting with people. If you love the power of connection and you love learning about people and getting to know them and I'm trying to help them in any way you can, but you got to know them first, then building relationships is kind of not that hard, right? Is You got to be interested in it. And I would recommend anyone to just push themselves. If they're not, if they're a little shy and meeting new people and thinking, oh, is this person going to want to talk to me? Push yourself to go to things, to go to events. I know COVID is its own animal and it's really hard and doing it through Zoom is not always, it's just not easy. It's a lot harder, but we will get back to normal and we will be able to be around people again and connect face to face. And that's always the ideal. And I think we just bootstrap and do our best with Zooms and meeting people and connecting in the meantime, but it's gonna get better. But if you love people, and that's something that I've always loved. Uh, My brother's my best friend. He's also my partner for Close Talk. He's the same way. We're fascinated by human beings and we're fascinated by ideas as well that human beings come up with um, and solving problems. And so um, after I was sick, I think it was part of loving people and being interested and meeting new people and hearing their stories and what do they do and learning and connecting, but also being so grateful to be alive that I was like, I'm not gonna sit at home. I literally, this sounds crazy. I was out the first few years in Chicago, seven days a week. I mean, I know not everyone can do that. People have kids, you have families, you have obligations. I just was like, if I sleep a little less these next couple of years, so be it. I am going to be out. I'm going to be around friends. I had a lot of Michigan friends at the time who were in Chicago. Many of them are back in Detroit now. Um, And we went out and we met people and we did dinners. We went to nonprofit events. Uh, We were always out in the gym. I'm also a seven day a week gym guy, which I know Manny is too. He's a big workout guy, which is great. I will tell you, so many of our initial board members, I met them at the gym. We all had a lot in common. We all cared about health. I mean, I think I don't want to generalize too much, but people that work out a lot and exercise a lot, they generally care about their own health. And I think those are people who care probably about other people generally as well too. You care about health, you care about wellness, you probably eat a little healthier. Um, I did a community of people we met at the gym who truly cared a lot. And there were survivors. Some of them were survivors. A gym called East Bank in Chicago has 13,000 members, one of the biggest in the country. And I went seven days a week for years. And so many of my friends, so many survivors joined us, so many future board members, but I built relationships while doing um, something that were in my value, being healthy, um, working out, staying active, not staying home, And I get that some people are a little more introverted. And I think you just do the best you can to be out and to build relationships. And I want to underscore this. I met so many people in social impact and so many people got involved by listening to people and what nonprofit events they were going to and going to support nonprofits. And not not all of them are expensive. I mean, I would go to $20 bar events sometimes where most people were young at Rocket back in 2005, which was like the hottest bar in Chicago. And that sort of became our community of building relationships. And I think, you know, I, I, I think about this idea of, you know, when in, in my marketing role, um, and as, as we talk about portraying brands or, or your own personal like identity, I think of this idea of, of being a beacon, I'll often say, right, where if, 
if we can be a beacon of and represent and communicate the things that we value, the things that we are trying to accomplish, the things that we hold dear, when we're a beacon and we're projecting those things, whether it be like you said, you're going to events and you're meeting people one-on-one. -on -one. In this world, that's a little bit more difficult, but whether it's a Zoom call like this or using a tool like social media, uh, being a beacon and, and projecting the things that are important to you and the things that you want to accomplish, right? And it, if we do that, it's like, it's no surprise, but it's amazing how then we can attract either like-minded people who have similar values, similar goals, um, or people who can help us accomplish the things that we want to do, right? But without taking that step of being that beacon, of, of projecting and communicating what it is that we're hoping to accomplish or who we are or why we do what we do, we don't allow for that opportunity to ever happen, right? Exactly right. You know, like attracts like. And if you want to be meeting people who care about other people, people that you want as your friends, but also maybe as business partners that you trust and they care and they're good people, you're right. You got to be a beacon of your values and you got to put yourself in circles where likely those people are. Nonprofit events, um, maybe yoga studios, workout gyms, um, going to restaurants that are maybe more organic or healthier. Um, I mean, places that you go, you're, I think being very, um, uh, what's the right word I'm looking for, but being very like intentional about where you go, you, you know you're gonna meet the people who also care. They generally, people who care about their health and their body, they probably care about the community and other people's health and bodies too, right? They, they're into that. And I think if you're intentional and in where you go and the things that you do with your values and you are a beacon, like you say, C-Miles, you're going to attract and connect with others and find a natural connection with them because you just share a value set. And I think we picked up volunteers easily. I used, we used to have people come up to us in Chicago in the early years being like, can you help other nonprofits and friends? Like, how are you guys picking up volunteers? You have like thousands of volunteers. Like, how do you have so many? And it was just, we just talked about our mission. We showed that we cared. Uh, we went to places that people are likely to go who do care. And, and if you're around those circles, um, I think it's just a matter of time. You're going to attract enough of the people to get involved, believe in what you believe in and help the mission get done. I like that you use the word intentional. Uh, one of the things that Manny in, in our culture will talk about often is the idea of intentional hustle, right? And that this word hustle is, is kind of this glorified term, but, but what it really comes down to is being very intentional about when we say hustle, you know, it's the where you're investing your time, your energy, your resources, and being very in intentional about that. How, how are you defining where you should be intentional with your time, your energy, your resources as a, as a business owner, how are you defining where that intention should go? You know, um, for me to be straightforward, it's really the values that I have um, and that I believe in, which is healthy food, um, healthy mind. I meditate every day. Um, going to the gym, like healthy body, going on walks, going for a run in Chicago by the lake shore. Um, we have a marathon team at Immerman Angels. It's actually our number one um, thing that we do in terms of like everything really. It's um, about a third of our 1.6, $1.7 million budget are from our 200 plus marathon runners that run the Chicago marathon for us every year. We have about 40 or 50 in Detroit who run for us. We have another 50 to 60, I'd say in New York who run for us. And it's become this like group that we just picked up runners. And it's like, I love Immerman Angels. I believe in the cause. I want to run for this. And that's who we are. You know, a lot of survivors, it's not um, probably any secret. A lot of survivors are out running. They're in the gym. They're eating healthy. I mean, not everyone, but because we've already been sick, we've already been sort of in the hospital, some of us for many years. And now we're so grateful to get a second chance at life. So you want to harness those values. You want to eat healthy. You want to exercise. So you're just around those people. But for me, how we picked up a lot of those people and our team 
was a lot of us in the beginning, the nucleus had those values of going outside, going for runs, meeting other people in the running community, training maybe with friends, um, meeting people at the gym who also work out and care about health um, and just being around the health-minded people that seemed to be the place for us that worked the best to build a community and bring these people on board. Yeah, I think that's great. You know, I'm, I'm curious as, as I'm hearing you talk, um, what's, as, as you look back on this journey of, of starting something of your own, of building this community with Immerman's Angels, also building Close Talk and building that platform and community, um, What's, what stands out to you as maybe the greatest lesson that you have learned on this, this entrepreneurship and leadership journey that you feel like has really impacted you most and, and might provide some insight to our audience? Absolutely. Uh, thanks for the question. You know, I think you have to have a lot of faith when you're a small business owner or you're going to be an entrepreneur or a founder or co-founder. I mean, I think everyone's really a co-founder because who's really a founder that does anything by themselves? Really no one. But everyone's, if you're a co-founder and you're doing it with a group, um, I think the number one thing is having the courage to jump in. And once you do that, it's scary. I get scared every time. We've had three startups. Um, one is gone. The first one that we tried, you know, it was two years. I learned a lot. It was expensive lessons. Well worth that I wouldn't change it. It gave me more tolerance and less fear to make bad decisions and fail. So you learn every time. And I think every co-founder has at least one failure story. I mean, I don't know anyone that nailed it the first time they ever tried it. So you get over yourself and you're like, hey, you tried it. And now you pick yourself back up and you try again. Immerman Angels, our second one is still going. We have 10 full-time staff, but we had to have the faith to jump in and say, we're going to figure this out because we know the world needs it. And we know we love providing these friendships for people with cancer. We see it work. People that we help tell us it works. We know we have a model that works. Let's figure it out as we go. The third one, back to the word faith, is Closed Talk, which we launched in 2017, 2018, directly from what we learned about branding Immerman Angels. So in the beginning of Immerman Angels, we thought we had a good idea. We saw it working in a very small scale and we learned that we had to reach more survivors. We only had a couple dozen survivors, but we know there are millions out there. And we, you're a marketing guy, C-Miles. We had a marketing problem, a branding problem. Like no one knew who we were. And the media started to pick us up and that helped. But the number one driver was we got obsessed with the idea of making our t-shirts cooler. We're like, we're gonna make cool t-shirts. We're gonna make them quality. We got all these $2, 5K t-shirts these nonprofit make, makes, no one wears them. They end up in the landfill. Like it's a broken model. And we were broken for a long time. It took us years to figure it out. We tried every color for our t-shirts, every graphic design you can imagine. Um, it was like an advertisement, taglines, mission statement, URL, company sponsors in the back. Nobody wants those. And what we learned was the simple, most obvious thing that we overlooked that all people wanted. And it literally was something just like this. Immerman Angels logo, a little smaller than the typical, a little more casual, um, black and white, no tagline, no mission statement. Doesn't tell you everything, but it tells you enough to spark curiosity. Well, what is that? And that's what we learn is where the magic happens. And of course, we put it on a very high quality t-shirt. We use Next Level brand out of LA, an American brand, also a very socially responsible brand, which matters to us too. And what people started to do in Chicago were like, that's a cool shirt. It's quality. And I love what it stands for. And I'll rock it at the gym three days this week. I'll rock it at WeWork while I'm working, walking my dog, going on for a run concert, Sox game, Cubs game. And the more our friends, like an ambassador rocked our logo, people started to recognize and ask like, who are the angels? Like what's Immerman Angels? And the word got out and more survivors joined us. We started helping thou recruiting thousands and helping thousands. This like drove our awareness. And at a certain point, C Miles, we said, okay, let's hire someone to run Emmerman Angels, which Stephanie's awesome. She's a lot more talented, better operator than I am. She runs her organization and let's go create again. But it's the faith that along the way with Emmerman Angels, we're gonna see something else 
that inspires us that we didn't know from the start and get obsessed with it and say, we can scale that same t-shirt model and what brands, the template, colors, black and white, simple. We can use that same model to help all nonprofits. And we want it to be zero investment, free for them. They don't have to build any tech. They don't have to figure out what are the right brands. They don't have to buy in bulk. We're gonna do it made to order, drop ship. We're gonna help get their logo on more bodies, make it cooler for them because we know nonprofits struggle. They all do. Marketing's not their jam. Mission is, and they should focus on mission. So we created Close Talk. We have 285-ish nonprofits so far. We're always looking for more nonprofits that are great. And we build them a free Shopify store and design their apparel for them with their logo. But our brands, 17 items from hats to yoga pants to t-shirts to track jackets, they're all made on demand. We drop ship them one off. They're all under one place. So think of closetalk.com, C-L-O-Z talk.com as a national vetted directory where you can trust the nonprofits. We know all of them. They're all 501Cs registered with the federal government. The books are clean. My brother, my partner, my best friend, also a lawyer by background. We go through everything so people can trust and you can search and click by category like animal nonprofits, arts and culture, um, helping the homeless, whatever you want, you can click through and you can learn about great missions, but you also can shop on their page and buy their single hat or a single t-shirt to say, I want to rep them. Like I want to be a brand ambassador. I'm a volunteer, a brand volunteer if I rock their logo and we make them one off, drop ship it. And ultimately when we become profitable, we're not profitable yet, but we're doubling sales every year. We're getting closer. And once we're profitable, then 20% of our net profits, we start donating back to the causes on top of getting their swag on more people, which grows their brand. And our big idea is we're going to go to companies soon um, to sponsor the causes in our network. So we'll go to a Google, a Walgreens, a Deloitte, places we already have relationships. And we say, hey, guys, why don't you buy one t-shirt for 20 bucks for every one of your employees, your most important resource. Every employee at Google, let's say, gets to go onto our site, read about all these great missions, get inspired, all different, find the one meaningful to them, pick that cause to rep it. We make them the shirt. And then once a month at the Google office, it's Foundation Friday. Everyone's rocking their favorite nonprofit shirt, all different ones. Coworkers start teaching each other about the missions. You have visual branding. They're looking at the shirt. They already know their coworkers, but it also opens their coworker up because it reveals so much about who Chad Miles is. If he's rocking a friendship circle t-shirt and I'm like, Chad, like I worked with you for years. Like what's friendship circle? And you're like, oh, they help people who have special needs. It's Detroit based and here's what they do and families that have autism and so forth. It's a wonderful center. But it tells me about Chad Miles because maybe there's someone you know or in your family who has special needs that why you would pick that cause. So it opens up coworkers to connect at a deeper level, which adds a better culture in the office, a more compassionate culture, and ultimately a more productive company. So we entice the companies to do this with us to help themselves with employee engagement and connection but it's all around what's your favorite nonprofit and being an ambassador for a cause. And we finally got the courage up enough to say, let's do it, let's go build it. Um, it's been a great journey. It's hard every day. We make mistakes every day. We learn, but we are relentless and we won't give up. And we're gonna figure out basically how we make it mainstream that rocking the nonprofit logo on your chest should be as common as seeing a Lions t-shirt or seeing um, Dallas Cowboys or Pistons, you know, if we can make it cool and hip, if it's quality to rock a nonprofit logo, you're going to spark conversations, you're going to meet new people, and you're going to spread love and good and what these things do. And that's what causes need. They need branding, they need to get their voice out. People will help them if more people know who they are. Of course, I'm, I'm biased because uh, I'm, I'm in the marketing world as well. But I, I just think, I think it's such a powerful thing, whether you are um, a nonprofit, whether you are a founder or a CEO of a company. Again, we, we, we work with the athlete market a lot. You know, the way that you're able to communicate your idea or share your story is so important because you could have 
the greatest cause, the, the greatest product, the greatest story even. But if you can't effectively communicate that with other people, um, if, if the best stories go untold, then, then the world doesn't get to receive the impact that, that could have been, right? That marketing piece, I think, is just, it's so important for any idea. It 100% is C-Miles. The story, I mean, you get that as a marketing person, the story of why someone does something or creates something tells you a lot about that person, but that's also what we remember. And every one of these nonprofits have these amazing stories on why someone created it, but they struggle to get the word out. So you're right. And if that story goes untold, it's all it's doing is having a ceiling, how much that nonprofit can grow. And ultimately, how much impact the nonprofit can really have. And we learn, just like with Immerman Angels or Friendship Circle, who's on Close Talk, Kids Kicking Cancer is on Close Talk. We have a bunch in Detroit. Alternatives for Girls, we love them. Mercy Education Project. We have Tech Town in Detroit, of course, love their work. But if less, more people know what these people do and the stories of what they do and why it matters, we're, all we're going to do is limit and bottleneck the impact they have. And if people are educated what's out there and the story reaches them, there's enough people, I truly believe this in my heart, there's enough people who are predisposed to loving them who will get involved, but the message has to reach them in order to spark something, to get them involved. And maybe it's on their board, maybe it's volunteering, maybe it's just writing a check and being a donor, but that's what the causes need. If we can take there, there are people who know them from X to 2X to 3X, and you grow the base of awareness and you market them, that's how they will grow. That's how the world becomes a better place through positive impact. So I think there's so much value in the work that you're doing, um, you know, especially through Close Talk. And, and I think that the impact that can have on so many nonprofits is going to be phenomenal. Johnny, as we, as we wrap up today, uh, where can people learn more about you, your story? Where, where can they connect with some of the things that you're working on and uh, some of the businesses that you're, you're leading? Thank you so much. You know, uh, Close Talk, C-L-O-Z, talk.com is our website. Anyone can go there. Everything is done online. We make them on demand, drop ship. So anyone wants to support their favorite cause, you have hundreds to choose from all over the US. And if you know more nonprofits as well, you think we should help. It's zero investment for them. We designed it so they don't have to pay anything. We do all the tech, logistics, distribution. They have no skin in the game. So we can just help them without risking any of their donor dollars or time. So please send any nonprofits to us. And um, on the... Immerman Angel side, if you know anyone touched by cancer who needs help, please send them to us. If you know survivors, family members who want to be mentors, immermanangels.org, I-M-E-R-M-A-N, angels.org. I know that name is hard. If you forget that, you can Google one-on-one -on -one cancer support and Google gives us a grant of $10,000 in credits. So those are keywords that we don't actually pay for. They're credits. So we own really one-on-one -on -one cancer support. We use all our credits to get that. So if anyone forgets the name, one-on-one -on -one cancer support, boom, we're going to pop up number one in the world. Johnny, thank you for sharing your story, uh, sharing some of your insights, some of your lessons. Uh, I think so many great takeaways, both for me uh, and, and for our audience today. So very grateful for your time and thanks for being with us today. See, Miles, you're a great interviewer, great questions. Pleasure to meet you and, and get to know you better today and um, keep up the good work you guys are doing, man. Any ways we can helpful, be helpful, please let me know. Thank you. It'll be well, all right? You too, brother. Take care. This episode of Vision, Hustle, Grit, and Gratitude is brought to you by our Michigan-based firm, Mass Mutual Great Lakes. Growing up as one of four boys outside of the city of Chicago, my brothers and I enjoyed an unbelievable abundance of faith, family, fitness, becoming ferocious competitors as young men, and gratitude for what it means to live in a free country. The one thing we lacked a little bit of on a consistent basis was financial resources. And lacking that level of financial security and stability and success prevented us from having one very special thing throughout our lives, which was consistently having the power of choice. 
Becoming a professional in our industry means that you have the opportunity to architect your clients, your friends, your family's financial household, their plan to create financial well-being and success throughout their lives. This alone empowers people to have the power of choice for themselves, their families, and the businesses that they serve and represent. Our firm is based in Southeast Michigan, and we're always looking to bring on great people, great people making great decisions consistently delivers great outcomes. If you'd like to learn more about career opportunities with our firm, visit greatlakes.massmutual.com backslash careers to start a conversation with our team today. We look forward to hearing from you. For more insights from top performers in sports and business, be sure to subscribe to Vision, Hustle, Grit, and Gratitude wherever you get your podcasts. Also, you can follow us on Instagram at Vision, Hustle, Grit, and Gratitude. Until next time, keep doing great things.